Well, hello, everybody. I think I'm going to get started. It's 1 o'clock. We might have other people that, uh, that uh, um, wander in, but I um, figure we can try to keep this, uh, keep this on time. Um, my name is Matthew Saunders. I am the CTO of uh, Trellin, uh, Trellin LLC. It's a Drupal shop uh, based in the United States, uh, largely, although it's a distributed team across um, uh, Ukraine, the United States, and Australia. Uh, it's a recent role for me. Uh, I've been there only about three months. Uh, prior to that, uh, I've, I've worked for three different, uh, three different uh, development shops, uh, ranging from, from shops that did custom PHP MySQL applications to, uh, to Drupal shops. If you would like to tweet anything, my, uh, my uh, Twitter handle is at Creech. If you'd like to ask questions uh, that, uh, that you know, I might uh, be able to answer later on, that would be great. Or if you want to follow me, that's terrific too. So I'm, I want to talk a little bit about who I am to begin with and, uh, and sort of how I came to, came to project management. Um, and I think that's important because uh, like a lot of people in the Drupal community, um, it wasn't such a straightforward path. Uh, I was originally in technical theater. Um, I was a lighting designer and uh, I worked uh, as a, as a uh, stage manager, a number of things like that for, for quite a few years. Uh, and it's funny because uh, I had, the last time I did this presentation, I had three people who came to me afterwards and said, you know, that's really weird. I worked in technical theater as well. Um, so there seems to be some kind of, some kind of uh, pre predisposed disposition for people who do that kind of work to do this kind of work. Um, I've worked in nonprofit management. Uh, I worked uh, uh, for a, a, a company called Westaf, the Western States Arts Federation in Denver, for eight years doing technology work for them and also managing grant programs. Um, I marketed for a, for a dance company. Uh, I worked in a bookstore, wine store, taught university. So, you know, there's a whole gambit of things that, uh, that I engaged in before I found my, found my way to technology. So Westaf was the first, first, uh, first sort of technology company that I, that I worked for. Uh, we did custom PHP MySQL applications there. It was a distributed uh, team of, uh, of developers. And that actually has ended up being a thread across uh, all, of the, all of the work that I've done in the past. Um, at Westaf, uh, near the end of my tenure there, uh, I ended up, I ended up uh, uh, going to Vancouver for uh, a number of seminars that had to do with Drupal. And I started drinking the Kool-Aid at that point. And I'll, I'll talk about that in, uh, in just a moment. Um, after I, I uh, completed sort of that tenure of work, I ended up working for a company called Ping Vision for a couple of years, um, where I built uh, with a great uh, group of developers a ton of Drupal sites, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 or 80 altogether. And that really, um, really ended up being a really great foundation for the work that I ended up doing um, at Examiner later on. Um, when I finished at Ping Vision, uh, a group of us formed a, a, a consulting company called Vintage Digital LLC. And that company uh, currently isn't really taking new, new clients, but it uh, sort of hovers along and keeps, uh, keeps moving along as well. And then there was uh, uh, this giant site that people might have heard of, examiner.com. Uh, that, uh, that I was asked to shepherd the, uh, the, the process of moving the site from, from uh, Cold Fusion uh, to Drupal 7 and move the database from Microsoft SQL to MySQL and MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB is the, ended up being the uh, database of record, but uh, MySQL continued to do things like bootstrap Drupal. Most recently, um, I was brought on to Trellin, as I'd mentioned, and uh, sort of this, this track goes all the way back to Drupal 4.6. So I've seen a number of changes to, to, the, uh, to the platform um, over, the, over the years, um, although a lot of it has stayed exactly the same, at least from a UI standpoint. Uh, if you want to contact me on a variety of different ways, uh, I'm Matthew S. on D.O. You can find me in IRC, um, Twitter, and so forth. 
So I'm a cuckoo. That's the way I like to, to uh, describe myself. Um, I uh, worked in the nonprofit industry for, for eight years, ended up uh, uh, finding my way to Drupal, happenstance encounter, as I'd mentioned, uh, uh, while in Vancouver. And w the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want to encourage everybody to, to think about when you see new people coming into the community. How many here are new uh, to the, uh, new to Drupal? Okay, awesome. And have, have you felt like the community has been welcoming to you, that, uh, that people have been, have been friendly and, uh, and have tried to, to, uh, to make you, you know, feel like you're part of, part of the overall group? That's awesome. So when you're in a year or in six months or whatnot, when, you're, when you uh, aren't noobs anymore and you see new people coming in, give them the same, the same kind of uh, experience. Um, that's exactly what happened to me. And it it transformed my uh, my my opinion of the of uh, of the of, of the platform because back in 4.6 it was really pretty rough. It was uh, it was, you know, it was uh, there were there were things like uh, um, CCK had just come into existence. Views didn't exist yet. There were a number of things that that uh, that made it a, a harder platform to work. But the community was what really hooked me and kept me going. Something that is important also when you're, uh, and we're going to talk about communication in a little bit, but when we're working with our clients, it's, it's common for us to forget that we communicate in a very different way. We're commu communicating through technologies like Skype and IRC. Um, and to our clients, these are really foreign. They're really odd. It's it's not a normal way of uh, of, of communicating, and in, and that kind of thing can lead to can lead to um, all kinds of uh, stress that uh, that you need to watch out for. So, you might find this familiar. You might find yourself in an emotional state with a client, where the client is read a little bit. And they're starting to throw out Drupal modules that you know really aren't that good, um, but they're insisting that maybe this is the route that you should take when you're when you're planning out a project. And it's a place where you where you uh, find that the uh, client is assuming that something is easy, and it won't take much time. But you know that that's not true. It's a place where you wonder where. Uh, you're actually going to finish a job, or even start the job, start the building of that job. And it's a place where you realize suddenly that the project is constantly in flux. Requirements are changing constantly. Change is the norm. Predictability is uh, evaporated. And it feels like, like the project sand under your feet. Everybody had that experience? Yeah? So. You kind of face this monster, and I don't know whether any of you uh, uh, have read H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, but um, there's, a, there's a, uh, a creature called Cthulhu. If you look in its face, you go insane. Um, sometimes that's how, that's, sometimes that's, that's how uh, project management uh, can feel. But our job um, is to communicate. It's to translate. It's to mediate. It's to unblock, and our job uh, to a large extent, is to take that chaos, turn it into calm. It's to make everybody else's job easier, and it's to make things that are complex simple. We break things down into small, bite-sized chunks so they can be executed upon. And if we're really successful, there, there'll be times when things look like they're running incredibly smoothly, and people on the team might say, why do we need project managers? And at that point, we have to make sure that we're not fooled by that, that, uh, that calm. Because we're the cat herders. And we don't just herd developers and themers. We also herd stakeholders, product owners, business owners, and clients. We have to keep communication running. We have to keep our ducks in a row. And above all else, we have to keep um, our developers from being distracted from shiny things, our clients from being distracted from shiny things. We need to keep people on track. 
So how many of you, uh, show, show of hands, how many of you have been in the middle of uh, a coding sprint and you've been asked to add one tiny little thing? And the, the, uh, the, uh, the reasoning behind it is it's going to make the, the website so much better. Um, and, uh, you know, you get, the, you get the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the statement. It can't take that long, right? How many of you have heard sort of the five lethal words? How, hard, bleh, how hard can it be? Show of hands. Yeah. So to keep all of this under control requires strong communication. And it's not just strong communication across your team. It's strong communication um, with, uh, with your clients and with everybody who might be peripheral to your team. Does anybody here know why manhole covers are really heavy and round? Right, but why are they round? Why aren't they square or rectangular or not a lot? Right, it can't fall into the hole, uh, and they're heavy because it means that it can't. It's it's hard for it to lift. Um, we do. We we are the manhole covers. We keep people from falling down holes, down rabbit holes, and getting hurt. Um, and. Our job is to prevent uh, our, our, ourselves, our clients, our colleagues from, from, from making, making mistakes that, uh, that cost money and time. So I want everybody to keep in mind that project management is 90% communication. Um, and it's setting up a framework where your team can effectively communicate with one another. And it's listening. It's listening for underlying messages, and it's listening, listening for the unspoken message. One of the things that will happen often is a client will fundamentally not know what you're talking about. And you'll assume, oh, they haven't objected, they haven't asked questions. Uh, they, must, they must know what it is, and they must be agreeing with the, with the direction that we're taking. Only to find three, four weeks later that, uh, that you've gone down a, a precipitous, horrible path um, that has wasted everybody's time and, and the client's money. Um, so you need to be an active listener. You need to be actively asking questions and making sure, verifying that the client um, actually understands what it is that you're offering. So I'm going to talk about three soft, uh, software uh, uh, project management methodologies. The reason I'm going to talk about three of them is that I've used them in my career uh, over the last 15 years with varying degrees of success. Um, and all of those uh, fed into an experience that I had with Examiner, which is where most of my remarks are going are to end up uh, uh, being structured around, um, that informed a process that we developed together there. So the first is Cowboy. Cowboy can be extremely unpredictable, but it's fast. It requires a great deal of, uh, of trust to exist between developers and stakeholders. And it can easily lead to miscommunication of expectations. It's highly informal. It focuses on stakeholders. It can be used, uh, like I said, in unpredictable projects. And it's excellent for rapid prototyping. So when I came to Examiner in December of 2009, I was handed a set of requirements that were like this. And I was told, uh, we need you to go through the requirements and uh, give us a sense of how long this project is going to take. Um, clearly, from the requirements, not a single person that had been writing them had ever um, uh, used Drupal, let alone, let alone ever uh, written requirements for, for Drupal. Um, so I proceeded to break it down into bite-sized chunks, and I Gantt charted the entire thing out. And what I found was that we're looking at about an 18-month cycle, which, you know, when you're talking about a migration of a site that large, and not just a migration, but also redesign and so forth, is actually pretty reasonable. Um, it was a migration that would become 7 million nodes across uh, 15 different content types, 200,000 uh, users that were active that needed to be, that needed to be uh, moved over, a bunch of stuff like that. So I went back to the executive committee and I said, 
OK, so here's the plan. I've got it all out here, and it's on a giant piece of paper, and we can talk through it. And what I was told was, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. We've got seven to nine months to get this done. And I just sort of went, oh, uh, all right. Well, there's only one way I know how to do this then with the time period that we've got. We've got to throw all these requirements away. We've got to talk about your basic business, uh, business needs. And then you've got to trust that me and the team, that we're going to um, give you what you need, but not necessarily what you expected. Um, fortunately, the, uh, the executive team was open to that. And we went into a period of time of rapidly um, iterating. Sometimes the iterations were as short as uh, half a day. Um, so we'd write code. And then we turn around and sit down with a product manager and say, does this look right? And we would do that over and over and over again. And in fact, certain portions of the design weren't completed until we literally were on the last day of development prior to, to, to launching the site. In situations like that, Cowboy can be quite effective. But the challenge is that it, it, puts, it puts the stakeholders in a place where they feel really out of control. Uh, and they are. They, at that point, they have very little control on how the project moves forward. So what that meant was, at the end of that seven to nine months, they were like, <laughs> we need predictability. And so we moved into more of a waterfall kind of uh, methodology at that point. And what that means is that you're sacrificing speed for predictability. It was much, much slower. Everything was having to be uh, uh, defined up front. And again, we were in a situation where uh, the project management team was teaching uh, the product team how to write requirements for, for Drupal because um, they were, simply weren't used to that. Um, and that ended up not being so successful. And the reason was that the, the, uh, the uh, uh, executive team had gotten used to things happening really, really fast. Um, how many folks here have worked with Waterfall? with the waterfall methodology? Yeah, most of you, that's cool. Um, and uh, how many of you, uh, in a, another show of hands, how many of you have actually had a waterfall project where the scope didn't change? <laughs> Ken, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> so I would, I, would, I would maintain that waterfall in its pure state, it doesn't exist. Um, except for Ken, because he's a hard ass. Um, and, and the reason that I say that is that you're always going to have a situation where a client comes back once, there's, once they start seeing what it is that you're building, and they say, whoa, that's not quite right. Um, which means that you're really, you're really engaged in, in uh, already engaged in, in a hybrid, more agile kind of process. Um, now, some people may disagree with me, and I know that there are lots of shops that have had had a lot of success um, working uh, in a wa waterfall methodology. But I tend to think that it doesn't work that well for Drupal projects, and that's because of community code. You can find yourself in a position where somebody is released to a set of modules that do very much what you need it for the client, and you install them, and they work great. And suddenly, you're managing to compress your timeline. Likewise. You can install a group of modules that you think that you're going to use, and then find something is conflicting. And then you've got to go through a whole series of debugging to figure out why it's not working the way that you expect it to work, which, which can then extend your, your, uh, your, uh, your timeline. The other thing about uh, uh, Waterfall is that sometimes, it depends on the, uh, the situation that you're in, but it can often make devs feel like they're not um, inclusive in the, in the, in the process. And the more that dev, the, your developers feel like they're included in the process, the more engaged they are, and the more um, they, will, they will own um, the, you know, those portions of the project. And you're going to end up having people who are far more willing to, to take the extra steps, uh, go the extra mile, uh, do the extra hours if need be, uh, in order to get a project, uh, project completed. Um, you can get into a situation where developers feel like they're order takers rather than, rather than uh, um, creative members of the team. And that's, that's a pitfall that you don't want to fall into. Um, you get people who are disengaged. Uh, you don't get nearly as good, uh, good a product at the end um, when that happens. 
So this is an experience that we had um, at Examiner. Uh, you felt like uh, maybe things were going fairly well in Waterfall, but then because of changes in the middle of the project and the desire for the, uh, for, for the client to have, uh, have things being displayed quickly, so they had things to look at, you suddenly feel like you're on a, on a jet plane that's uh, out of control. Um, I certainly felt um, uh, a good portion of the time that it was plan but hurry up, plan but hurry up, plan but hurry up. And uh, I, I, I don't think that that works all that well. So then we get into Agile, and Agile requires that we weave, that we move, that we're flexible, and that there's predictability in a single, uh, in a single time box as to what the deliverables are. Agile doesn't mean the client can suddenly say at any time, oh no, that's not right, I want to, I want to do something else. What it means is that you're defining short sprints and you're saying, in this period of time, this is what we're going to accomplish. You have defined time boxes. Um, you work in iterative development methods. That means that as you build things, as you, as you prototype things, um, you'll, you'll, you'll rapidly iterate on those prototypes depending on what the feedback is that you get from the client. Um, and in some cases, you may actually throw a chunk of code out entirely because it doesn't fit their, fit their needs. It's incremental, and it tends to be collaborative. And this is where developers really get engaged and, uh, and really end up um, uh, becoming invested in a project. Um, within multiple time boxes, uh, it puts you in a place where you can be rapid and flexible and responsive to change. And I think the last point is almost the most important, that when you're in an agile environment, your teams are self-organizing. The developers sit down and they say, oh, I want to do this. And another developer says, oh, I want to do this piece. And you take a look at your time box and eventually you figure out who's, who's going to do what uh, with the project management team ensuring that nobody's uh, um, taking on too much or too little. So to recap that chunk, a cowboy fast can cause problems with expectation gaps between business and team can be volatile. Um, waterfall, slow, change is inevitable, which makes, makes for um, rough situations sometimes. Requirements often fight what Drupal does naturally if you don't have folks who know Drupal writing the requirements. Um, developers become order takers, not active participants. So phase three of this is I'm going to talk about the uh, agile hybrid approach that, uh, that we ended up developing. Um, at Examiner. This is going to be pretty high level. Uh, I'm not going to get into nitty-gritty nitty details, um, but folks are uh, welcome to talk to me about uh, the details after the, after the presentation if you'd like. So I like this slide. Um, it is how one group sees another group. And what I found across four different, uh, four different companies is when you get into the situation where, where team members are fractured, they're not, uh, they're not communicating well, um, they don't feel invested, um, you get factions of groups. So you've got developers who see designers as, uh, as uh, uh, babies in a bunch of, uh, bunch of paint, and you've got uh, Develop, uh, you've got developers who see designers as, uh, rather designers who see developers as being big babies and, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards. Um, you don't want that to happen. You want the team to be cohesive. And without, when, when you get into this situ situation, there's no traction. You don't have any traction any longer. There's a lack of trust. And there's frustration amongst folks uh, across different departments, and that can actually ooze out into into uh, into your clients uh, your clients' uh, vision of who you are as well. Uh, it makes for not high functioning teams. So, one of the things that we needed to do was we needed to develop a process that would work for everybody across the team. And what this really means is that you have to have everybody involved in making the decisions of how you're going to operate. Um, everybody needs to have input and everybody needs to have buy-in because if you've got one bad apple, it kind of makes the, the whole house of cards fall apart. 
everybody has expertise, um, and uh, uh, and they can bring that expertise to the to the table from the bet, uh, from the get go, um, and that's really important. So, in the book Outliers by Malcolm, Glad Malcolm Gladwell, um, he talks about how in the 90s, a number of commercial fl flights, quite a few, more than average, started crashing. There was, no, there was no reason from a technical standpoint why this was happening. There was no reason from an environmental standpoint. They weren't flying into hurricanes or anything like that. Um, so, as it was uh, being, being uh, investigated as to what was going on, it turned out that communications were constrained by the rules of social hierarchy. First officers and engineers weren't talking to the captain because, they, because they, they had the expectation that they weren't supposed to talk to the captain. They didn't feel at ease to speak directly to them and uh, talk about concerns. So planes were going down because people with expertise who could advise, weren't advising. They weren't speaking up. They weren't being heard. One of the strengths of Agile is that it is flat. Everybody's equal. Everybody, everybody has a say. Um, when you're working in Agile, anybody who's in, on the team is allowed to write uh, user stories based on, based on, the, on the business requirements. Um, everybody everybody is, is supposed to be listened to. So it's really critical that you start creating an environment where everybody feels comfortable offering suggestions. And this puts us in a place where it's much easier to identify risks and then unblock problems. It's really important to have communication um, via scrums. So every morning, uh, having a 15-minute stand-up where you just go through, uh, go through uh, um, um, each project really quickly that you're working on no more than 15 minutes uh, is really important. And then retrospectives and demos at the end of the, uh, the sprints um, are often um, overlooked, uh, but I think are critical to the process. You want to have a culture that eliminates blame, where people can own mistakes, and that they are asking for feedback, and that they feel like they're being listened to, and that when they have, uh, and, and, and when, uh, when other people are speaking, that they're being listened to as well. So I'm going to talk about four different roles um, that, uh, that we had there. The first was the project management team. Um, in our case, these guys uh, acted as scrum masters. They, leaded in, they led in, uh, in uh, pointing out projects. And pointing out projects just means figuring out how long something is going to take, how difficult it is. Um, they were responsible for protecting the dev team from distractions during coding sprints. As we get into the timeline, um, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and they, they, their, their job was to ensure that the team didn't make mistakes. It's really common for developers to have the most rosy picture of how long it's going to take uh, for, uh, for, for a given chunk of functionality to be completed. And uh, you, need to, you need to have in your head a sort of factor. Um, this developer consistently um, takes 20% longer than, uh, than, than they think that they're going to take. In a few cases, you, you'll have developers who actually work faster than they, than, they, than, than they expect. But you need to start thinking about, you know, how long is this actually going to take? And, and um, protecting your team from making commitments that they can't uh, follow through on. And then finally, the project management team managed the schedule. Yeah. So, um, in in agile, um, rather than talking about hours or days, you're talking about story points. So you're you're identifying how tough something's going to be, and a point a point is a weird thing. It it can it can talk about difficulty, but it also can talk about time at the same time. Um, and there are lots of really great books on, on how, to point, uh, how to point user stories um, for, for, for Agile. But yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so then the, the second group were the product team. Now, the product team um, owns the backlog. The backlog is a long list of, uh, of features that uh, ultimately you're going to build. Um, and they would write the personas, epics, and stories. A persona is uh, basically 
um, who it is that's going to use the site and how they're going to use it, um, and what their perceptions are going to be of the site. Um, epics are like sort of overreaching uh, stories. And then stories are you know, one sentence. Um, as a site visitor, I want, to, uh, I want to be able to register for a newsletter. That would be a simple story. Um, we don't want the product people trying to write requirements because they're not very good at it. But they are very good at identifying what the business needs are. Um, so then the other thing the product team need, uh, needs to do is clarify business needs. So if the story doesn't make any sense, uh, the, project, the project team needs to work with the, uh, the product team to make sure that uh, they get to a place where it does make sense. And then finally, the product team should be demoing the software at the end of the sprint. Developers self-organize uh, the selected stories in a given sprint. Um, they figure out who's going to do what, when they're going to do it. Um, they decide what can and can't fit into a given time box. So if you empower your development team to say, you know what, we can finish this amount of stuff, but not this amount of stuff, you, 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 you're typically going to find yourself in a place where they meet those expectations consistently. Then they define the implementation of those business needs. So you don't have a situation where you've got folks outside the development team who are trying to tell the development team how to design um, the software. Um, you're looking at business needs and trusting that the development team are going to implement on those business needs uh, effectively. And then finally, they execute. So I'm going to talk now a bit about a 20-day sprint. That's a four-week sprint. Um, you can easily break this into a two-week sprint. I've done both. Um, they both have uh, different advantages and different shortcomings. But for the, for the sake of this, uh, this presentation, I'm going to talk about a four-week sprint. Um, a four-week sprint isn't just the developers writing code. I like to talk about a 60-40-20 uh, ratio. Uh, 60 days out, I want for the business to be thinking about what it is that they want to have built in the future. I want them to be thinking, uh, you know, in general, what direction the ship is going to be going in, and, uh, and communicating with the product team as to how, when they'd like to see, in general, these, these features get to developed. 40 days out, you've got your product team who are writing stories, creating the artifacts like wireframes and, uh, and comps to support those stories. And, uh, and getting the project team and the development team to a greater and lesser ex extent um, being involved in, uh, in uh, asking questions and, and so forth. So you get a nice long backlog of user stories that are completed with art artifacts. And then the, the, most, the, uh, the current 20 days is where we're actually engaged in the, uh, in the sprint, the coding of, uh, of what it is that we're building. So the product creative timeline looks a little bit like this. Those first two days that are green are planning days. Um, those are devoted to the development team. And basically during those two days, the product team has to be involved in helping, helping clarify any last questions that the development team has had in the previous sprint having to do with this set of functionality that's being built. After those first two days, the team goes into uh, into uh, um, days three through twelve, where uh, where where uh, where the product folks are engaged in writing the stories for the next for the next sprint, and uh, taking care of developing ar the artifacts, comps, um, wireframes, and and so forth. And then when you look at days thirteen through eighteen, those are meetings, finalizing comps, delivery of the epics and the stories, and then on day nineteen. They have to lock down the time box. They have to say, OK, this is what we're doing next time around. Um, you don't want, once the lockdown occurs, you don't want there to be shift. Um, you want the, the time box that you're currently in to be fixed. Um, so you've got predictability for everybody across the team. And then on the last day there, it's demo and retrospective. And the product team would demo the current software that's just been built. So then you've got the development team. The first two days, they're, they're asking questions, they're clarifying, 
Um, they're they're uh, putting together their technical ar architectures. They're making sure um, that they're talking amongst themselves to incur uh, to to ensure that they're they're uh, engaged in the most efficient way of, of developing that chunk of functionality, whether it's custom code or contributed modules or a combination of the two. After the uh, the first two days, and their days three through twelve are are uh, head down to the ground, they're coding. And during that period of time, the project management team is, is, is acting as defense. They're making sure that the, that the uh, developers aren't getting you know, tapped on the shoulder and questions are being asked of them uh, by, the, uh, you know, by other, other folks on the team. Uh, because those kinds of distractions are really expensive. You don't want your developers during that period of time to be engaged in context switching. You want them to be thinking only about what they should be doing during that sprint. Days 13 through 18 is the time that, uh, that uh, the functionality that they've built is uh, being debugged, tested, et cetera. Uh, and it's also the time where they have a chance to talk to the uh, product team and the project management team about the next sprint. What are the stories that are coming, coming up? And, uh, and uh, you know, this doesn't make sense to me, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and then on day 19, deployment, and then day 20, uh, demo and retrospective. It's really important that to you know to to understand that these th three sets of sprints are overlapping. So you've got the business that are thinking about what they want in the future. You've got the product team who are who are and the designers etc. who are thinking about what's going to happen next. And you've got the development team who are doing what's happening now. So that it ends up looking a little bit like this, where everything's overlapping. Yeah? Um, typically, typically the, uh, the, each of the teams, hmm, two developers, one themer, project manager, um, and, a, and a QA person. So fairly small teams. Yeah? This, this was for a four-week sprint, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're very occupied because they're looking at the uh, at the stories for the next uh, for the next sprint, and they're and they're fixing bugs as the QA team uh, um, identifies bugs. But one of the things that uh, that I found was that when you can get developers into a cycle where they're doing slightly different things over over periods of time, they stay fresh, um, and they stay engaged. If you have them doing nothing but coding all the time. Um, they they uh, they start to lose their edge. So it's it's a good way of keeping keeping things sort of mixed up. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Peer review is is critical. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that we did was we uh, we then took all of these deadlines that you see in here. And the project management team would um, assign these in Google, Google, Google Calendar to each of the people that had, that had deliverables. So they would automatically start getting pinged a day before, you know, this is what, this is what you've got to do tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and the idea behind that was to make sure that the artifacts, the stories, uh, the epics, uh, the comps, the wireframes, all of these things are getting done when they need to get done. Yeah. Maybe I got the wrong but does it have contradict the concept of having a self organized team? Well, uh, the self organized team are looking at uh, at the, the current stories and deciding the developers are deciding who's gonna do what and when. Um, in terms of uh, producing your producing your 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 user stories to begin with, um, and uh, and uh, producing the wireframes and comps and so forth. Um, the, the product team and the design team have to work together in, in terms of that and identify who's going to do what. And the project management team, their, their responsibility at that point is to make sure that all of that's being scheduled correctly. But you may have one designer who says, oh, I want to do this piece of the, of, of the, next, uh, of the next sprint. Uh, that's, that's also, you know, you end up having, having fairly self-organized self teams there as, as well. Yeah. So 
that brings us to demos and retrospectives. Um, if you if you start using an agile methodology, don't let don't let uh, the uh, the uh, um, high, higher ups in the company tell you that demos and retrospectives aren't valuable. I think that one of the things that you that you'll find with a demo is that it helps everybody know what everybody else was working on, and in the future that pays dividends because somebody may have worked on a on a chunk of functionality that applies to another project to another client in the future. Um, and because the demos occurred, it gets sort of into the, into the uh, culture and the ethos of the entire company as to the kinds of things that have been worked on. Um, it also means that everybody knows what the status is of a given, given project at a given time. So there's sort of check-ins um, across the company. It builds respect because uh, people like to show what they've done. They like to be proud of what they've worked on. And it uh, lets folks know who to ask um, questions of and who to go to um, in terms of uh, learning how to use a given chunk of the product if need be. Directly after a demo, it's a really good idea to have a retrospective. Traditionally, these are called postmortems. I hate that word um, because people aren't dying. Um, so I like to call them retrospectives, where you look back at your, at your time box and you talk about what worked and what didn't work. And it needs to be a safe environment where everybody feels like they can, they can discuss what worked and what didn't work. But at that point, you can then iterate your process and improve your process. Um, so so each, each sprint, each time box becomes better and better and better and smoother and smoother and smoother. During the, the, uh, the retrospective also, it's, it's, uh, the project management team is uh, held accountable for any problems that had been discussed in the previous sprint if they haven't been addressed in the current sprint. So that gives you a sense of sort of the timing across the sprint. If you take this down to a daily level, um, it's important to have daily scrums. And that's literally 15 minutes. You get up, you talk about what you did in the last 24 hours, what are you going to do in the next 24 hours, and what are your blockers. Once you've identified what the blockers are, you don't want the team talking about them in that meeting. You want them to break off into, into, uh, into groups of people that can solve those problems outside of the, outside of the scrum. You want it to be fast um, and then over. So tools, uh, I'm going to talk about tools for a few minutes. Um, it's really important that you not get yourself into a position where you believe that the tools are what define your process. You want to have a strong process in place to begin with and then have the tools support that process. Um, all the companies that I've worked for have been highly distributed. Even the ones that were bricks and mortar were highly, highly distributed or they um, acted as if they were highly distributed um, uh, for, for you know, a variety of different reasons. Um, as, a, as a culture, Drupal operates in IRC a great deal. Even bricks and mortar um, companies, the team members will be communicating in IRC. And uh, you know, it would be really great for you to um, um, talk to your system administrator if, uh, if you haven't already to uh, get Morbus Ifs bot module. Um, installed, so it's logging the IRC channel that you're that you're working within um, to a Drupal instance, so you can go back and you can take a look at the uh, communications that have been going on. Um, one of the things that I do every day um, and have for six years is I'll do a rapid scan of the previous day's logs to see what people were talking about, to see whether there were any any issues that need to be addressed that uh, folks aren't bringing up. It's just a really good practice. And then, of course, Skype uh, for, for, for communication via voice. Um, in my current job, we're starting to use Google Hangouts a whole lot. And uh, um, they're, they're, they're great. Um, one of the reasons that they're so powerful is that uh, it's not just video chat. You also have uh, an IRC-style chat um, um, sort of on the left-hand side. And you can screen share in ways that you can't do in groups in Skype. Um, so you, you might want to check out Hangouts if you haven't. Um, it's a pretty, pretty great communication tool. 
Also, Google Docs are really handy. So what you see here is a, uh, is a uh, list of user stories. Um, the user stories that are green are ones that have been completed. The user stories that are yellow are ones that are currently being worked on. And the, the areas that are pink um, are identifying where questions have emerged um, from, from the team, questions that need to be answered. Across this Google Doc, um, you'll see that there's story ID, priority, where, where the artifacts live for, that, for, this particular, for this particular story, the actual story itself, any notes that are there, feedbacks, feedback, links to comps, timing of when it's going to occur, ticket numbers, level of effort, who the, who the lead dev, themer, QA product person um, is going to be. Um, this was a, a really effective way um, when we were using track. Track has, um, you know, in terms of uh, ticketing. When we we, uh, we uh, migrated uh, the team from track to Jira with Greenhopper, um, uh, which is another which is another ticket management system. Greenhopper makes it great for for doing agile projects, and we actually got rid of the Google Docs entirely because we were able to do the same thing um, natively within within uh, Jira with Greenhopper, um, but. Um, still, this is a good way of, uh, of managing, managing the, uh, the uh, um, stories within a given sprint. Single place, you can see what the stories are, you can put in your questions. Um, so other tools that, uh, that uh, sort of sit in the, in, the, uh, in the toolbox, I've talked about track a little bit. Um, some kind of uh, repository, you want to make sure that you're using a repository, GitHub is great. Um, we use Skitch pretty heavily because we're a Drupal shop, uh, rather a, a Mac shop. Skitch is so you can do uh, screenshots um, and uh, um, they can be uh, assigned to tickets and so forth so you've got uh, visual representations of what you're looking at. Um, our DevOps uh, folks were using Jenkins for, uh, for doing deployments. Um, basically Jenkins is a, is a, uh, a wrapper around scripts. So you can script all of your different DevOps types of things, and then use Jenkins to to uh, to uh, run those scripts in a predictable way. Um, different Google Google uh, documents. Um, uh, we use Drupal for for logging our, our IRC channels. Jing for for doing um, video um, on uh, uh, problems that you might be seeing. Same with ScreenFlow, and then Jira as well. Started using Google Hangouts, like I said, join me as well, which is another good, uh, a good screen sharing um, piece of software. It's free. Um, and, uh, and again, the IRC channels. What happened for us is that we went from being fractured and uh, being ineffective um, to being a highly cohesive group that was getting work done much faster much more efficiently uh, with a higher degree of quality when we moved out of, uh, out of uh, um, working um, in, a, in a waterfall methodology uh, into a more agile uh, methodology. And it put us in a place where we weren't overburdened by specific requirements, that we knew what the general, uh, general needs were of the business, and then those general needs were interpreted by the development team um, and, uh, and then executed by the development team in that, uh, in that fashion. Um, I think that uh, that uh, it put uh, put that team in a place where we were del delivering what uh, what the business needed, not necessarily what they expected, but what they needed, um, and it also allowed us to rapidly iterate on on uh, on pieces of functionality. So that's the end of my presentation, my my remarks. We've got a few minutes for, for questions. If folks have questions. But go ahead and uh, use the microphone. I think the microphone is, yeah. So, um, first question is around uh, QA team. Uh, is, it, is, they, it, is it on? OK. Can anyone hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can do that. Yeah. I'm assuming you're putting your test cases in Jenkins or something like that. 
um, the, the, the test cases weren't being put into Jenkins, but the, but the, uh, but, uh, um, simple tests were being written. Um, so there was test-driven uh, test test uh, development that was going on. So the tests were being written before the, uh, before the uh, um, code was actually be, being written. But at the same time, the QA team were, were, uh, were developing um, uh, test cases for, for um, uh, testing the, 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 the UI and the UX after the fact, and also putting together uh, regression tests for the, for the entire, for the entire um, site. So each, so each uh, development cycle, each sprint, uh, a full regression could be done of the site prior to pushing the next set of uh, code to production. Um, some of it was manual, some of it was using Selenium. Um, so it was a variety of different, uh, different uh, kinds of uh, efforts that were being taken on that. So you know there was there were written test cases, the the simple tests that had been written, and then selenium selenium tests that had been developed as well. So the reason I was asking that is to say you know there's a debate in our company about what the quality of QA engineer is supposed to be. Are they to be good enough to handle the company with a few codes mm -hmm. and write the manual test cases, for example? Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, in 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 our case, the uh, the QA team um, were not developers. Um, they were individuals who um, had uh, experience in in writing test cases, but not necessarily necessarily reviewing code. And because there's heavy peer review going on through the whole process. Um, it was, uh, you know, that, that level of QA was being done by the development team themselves. One more, and then we'll go on to... Oh, yeah. paired programming is great if you've got the, if you've, uh, if you've got the, uh, um, the time for it, A, because it takes a little bit longer. Um, B, um, when you're working with junior developers, um, it's fabulous. It's a great experience to have a senior developer working directly with a with a with a more junior developer. Um, uh, I think the uh, I think the uh, the challenge is really if you're if you're in a very very tight uh, time time crunch. Sometimes it's easier for for a for a for a developer to simply take on the task and then hand off their code to for for peer review after the fact. But I, I I'm a I'm a fan of of paired programming. I think it's good. Sure. So if you're dealing if you're dealing with banking, um, you don't want to be doing agile, like you you don't you want to uh, because you don't want scope creep in that in that instance at all. You want you want all of your requirements up front because uh, you make one mistake, um, you're 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 up the creek. Um, so if you're talking about you know something like that, I I, I wouldn't recommend using agile. I would go right back to a to a uh, to a uh, a waterfall a waterfall uh, process, and I would be doing a heck of a lot of uh, of uh, of prototyping and paper prototyping to begin with, so they know exactly what it is that they're getting, and you get sign off at every single uh, step. But yeah, I, I wouldn't I would, you know, anything that's dealing with with money like that. It's, I, I imagine two really senior guys sitting together. Yeah. Like Sure, like sure. Yeah, you can you can use two senior guys together as well um, in paired programming, and that works really well. Um, if you're talking about uh, having them having them sort of bounce ideas off of one another. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure. So the question was. Uh, um, um, I made a made a statement that uh, that uh, certain members of business aren't great at writing requirements. Who should be writing the requirements? So I, I would break this up into different kinds of requirements. When you're talking about the business needs, the business requirements, absolutely, 
um, having some kind of of uh, of, uh, of narrative that explains what it is that the uh, that the business is looking for should be written by um, uh, the product team in conjunction with the with the uh, with the leadership of the company. What I'm talking about is uh, is when you get to a point where where you're talking about how to actually execute on those needs. So you have your, your business requirements to begin with, and then the, product, then the product team takes those business requirements and writes their, their, their user stories based on what uh, leadership has indicated that, uh, that they want. Leadership signs off on those, uh, on those uh, um, user stories and epics. And at that point, it's handed off to the development team who look at the user stories, and they're the ones that do the technical, the technical uh, requirements based on the user stories. Um, that's what I was talking about. So a requirement is a, uh, it has to be, it has to support thousands of current users of uh, Mongo and Rebus. Mm -hmm. Based on what you're saying, it sounds like that's not something that's going to be anyway. Right? The business can say it needs to support a thousand concurrent uh, users, but the business can't say this is how we want you to do it. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure. So the question is, can this work on multiple projects uh, uh, with smaller teams? Um, yeah, uh, it's a little rougher. It's a little harder. Um, uh, the the trick is to is to try as much as possible to encapsulate those te those individual small teams on on uh, on single projects. Um, so you're not trying to have uh, um, competing interests uh, uh, engaged um, with one another across projects. Uh, that's actually one of the things that uh, we're working on at Trellin right now to figure out how best to um, implement this kind of process and, and uh, understanding that we may have anywhere from, from uh, um, 10 to 12 projects that are cur currently running at various levels of, uh, of, of completion. It can be done. Um, certainly have, have uh, been successful in, in other shops in the past, um, but it's a little tougher, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. How do we what? Oh, how, how, the question is, how do we sell uh, Agile to clients? So there are a couple of ways that it can be done. Um, there are a number of, uh, of high-profile shops that do just that. They sell sprints. They don't sell um, requirements. They don't, uh, uh, you know, they'll look at requirements and they'll say, ah, we think it'll take about this amount of time. But then they sell sprints. Um, so they say, you've got two weeks, and uh, you've got two developers and a themer and a project manager, and uh, you uh, will we'll help you identify what we're going to do in each of those sprints. And then they sell those sprints. And when the client says, you know, we're done, then, then, uh, then they're done. Um, when you're talking about fixed bid projects, um, we, the, way, the way that I approach it is I don't talk about agile. I don't talk about sprints. They don't get it um, often. Um, they're looking for, for specific results. We may act in a sprint fashion. We may behave as a team in a sprint fashion. Um, and, and, uh, and what we'll end up doing is saying to the client, we need you to take part in 15-minute daily, daily conversations um, to, to clarify issues as needed. We need you to take part at the end of two, each two-week period in a, in, a, in a review of the, uh, of the, of the work that we've done. Um, so it, you, you approach it in a different way. You don't, you don't end up talking about Agile and Scrum and sprints and, and, and so on. Because uh, I think it's a foreign concept um, to a lot of uh, a lot of clients who just want their website built. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure. Um, the question is: uh, one of the slides talked about uh, how cowboy can uh, can. Uh, um, uh, damage relationships with, uh, with stakeholders. So the whole notion of cowboy is that you are inc you are, you're working in a small team that doesn't have any set requirements, that have a, a vague idea of what it is that you're building, 
and then you go and you rapidly iterate, right? And if you've got a tight team that are all on the same are all on the same page and they're doing prototyping, that works really well. But if you've got stakeholders who are outside of that tight little team, um, who are are perhaps um, uh, maybe um, a client, or if it's a company that you're working within that have their own website that you're working on, you can miss expectations uh, completely because they're 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 separated from the process. Um, and you know, a cowboy requires you to be highly engaged in the process all the time. Um, and once you start missing missing those expectations, it damages uh, it dam damages trust, da damage, and that'll ultimately damage those relationships. And once you lose trust, um, you, you know you're sunk. Uh, the question is, have I ever seen that happen? Absolutely, 100%. I've seen I've seen trust get destroyed, and uh, and uh, and uh, um, teams deep teams become dysfunctional because of. Uh, of those missed ex expectations. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question. You, you didn't mention velocity. Uh, sure. But uh, I, I can, I don't need to go too deep in that, but I can just mention a scenario. Uh, um, uh, the human resources for when you make this schedule for, for the sprints. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the developers maybe they catch the flu, the flu, and mm -hmm. under the weather for like yep. a week, and then you can't get all of the user stories you planned from the beginning maybe, and then uh, and then your your schedule didn't really adapt to that. If you do it in like Google Docs, you have to move stuff around like a lot and do a lot of replanning. And uh, do you have any idea how to tackle that? Sure. So the the uh, the uh, question is, uh, um, in instances where unpredictability of people's lives, like getting the flu, um, uh, disrupt a, a sprint, how do you adjust for that? Um, so in Google Docs, I agree with you. It's a lot harder to to shuffle things around. If you're using a tool like uh, like uh, uh, Jira with Greenhopper, you can pull you can pull tasks out of uh, out of a given sprint. And move them into the next sprint, um, and uh, and it'll automatically uh, readjust your 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 uh, your velocity. The whole notion of velocity is that uh, there's a certain speed at which you can complete uh, complete tasks, and it goes back to the points. Um, and if you've got fewer if you've got fewer user points available um, to the team during a, a given sprint unexpectedly, then your velocity is slowing down s significantly. Um, Using Google Docs, I mean, uh, what what we would do is we'd gray out, um, we would gray out on the on the doc um, any stories that we had decided we weren't going to address at this time, and then it would end up in another tab, and they uh, the uh, the product team would literally copy and paste those uh, those uh, those grayed out uh, um, stories to the next uh, to the next sprint. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. Um, there was a gentleman back there actually. Sure. So the the question the question was uh, um, uh, when you after the demo and the end user starts playing with the uh, with the product, um, how do you deal with uh, with uh, change requests, bugs, etc. Is that is that uh, accurate? Yeah. So there are two ways that uh, that uh, um, we've um, addressed that. The first is that um, change requests get put into the backlog. And are uh, and are uh, um, prioritized by the uh, by the uh, um, leadership team um, in whatever sprint they decide they, they want those uh, those those uh, changes to be put in place. Um, for bugs during the um, QA period in the in the next uh, in the next uh, in the next sprint, provided uh, provided it isn't a critical bug, 
um, it's addressed during those uh, those days that were yellow on that on that slide. If it's critical, then then uh, then we may be in a position where we're saying, okay, we have to we have to pull um, this resource off for this amount of time uh, to complete to complete these tasks. That was disruptive when we first started doing it, but we uh, we ended up uh, building a a uh, rapid response team. Um, so there were each each uh, each uh, sprint there would be one or two individuals who would be uh, devoted to bug fixes and so forth, um, and that that actually ended up working really really well for us. All right, I think that we've run out of time. Um, if people want to chat with me, um, feel feel free to feel free to uh, grab me in the hallway or 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 whatnot. I'm I'm uh, I'm friendly. Um, and uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you uh, wouldn't mind uh, making sure that you put feedback, that'd be, be fabulous. I'd appreciate it. Um, and my slides are, uh, are up on, the, uh, up on the, uh, uh, the page that had the description of the, the session um, at this point, I believe, uh, and my contact information's in there. So feel free, to, feel free to reach out. Happy to chat with you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>